right. Good morning, friends. Welcome to Centennial United Methodist Church. Excuse me, Centennial United Methodist Church. Goodness, it's good to be with you all. Happy uh, almost, uh, anyone have any kids that were, who were actually in summer yet? Are we close? June 10th? That's for my kids. No, not yet. Almost. We're getting close, guys. All right, let's stand and uh, sing together. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, He holds the victory. Yeah. It's good.
That was fun. There, there are Sunday mornings that it just feels like we're, we're 
you're being pulled, which is hopefully good. Oh, man. It's good to be with y'all. This morning before we came up here, I prayed that, um, that in some way we'd all encounter God this morning, and whether that's through the music or the band, that is our goal, to come in contact with something wholly different than us, that can point us in the right direction. Let's pray together. God, thank you for the opportunity to gather. Thank you for each one of these friends. Thank you for the gift of coffee. Thank you for the joy that can be found in this place in so many different ways, through, through friends, through smiles, through songs, through words, through our pastor. I continue to meet us here, not that we might silo ourselves in this building, but that we might go out and impact the world. So in your son's name we pray. have a birthday to celebrate. Oh, man. Ooh, Lois is turning 80 this week, so join me in singing happy birthday to Lois. <laughs> happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Lois. Happy birthday. Birthday. We can play the video again or not, whatever. It is. There it is. Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. We need to give an extra thank you to the band and AV today because they walked in and found there'd been a power outage and all of the sliders were at zero. <laughs> and somehow in the last hour and a half, they managed to make magic happen. So <laughs> it was a little bit of a rough morning, but I think we got there. <laughs> Welcome to Centennial. My name is Monique. I'm glad you're here today. Our mission is to be authentic, thinking, active disciples of Jesus. My seven-year-old Maddie is there. She just rolled her eyes at me. It was pretty good. <laughs> My husband in the back with AV, who was helping with the fun today, and we've already sent the two-year-old downstairs. Do us a favor, fill out the Connect card. It's going to pop up on a QR code in front of me, behind me. It's also in the seat back pocket in front of you. If you don't have one and want a paper one, just raise your hand, and I can grab one when I'm finished. It looks like, from what I'm reading... That Pastor Jen and Whitney are also asking for some patience in the next five days. So the church is going to migrate a church management system. And if any of us have done this before for anything at work, I'm going to assume you also know that it never goes perfect. <laughs> so give them some, uh, some grace in the next five days. They hope it's a trans smooth transition. I think we all know that with technology, there's going to be a hiccup. Um, so give them some space and some time and just some help with the bumps along the way. Finally, it's time to register for Vacation Bible School. We're going to do that Wednesdays from 5 to 8, from July 17th to August 14th. There's volunteer sign-up online, and the kids' registration will go live as soon as the church management system transition is complete. So, well, next Sunday? Oh, at least two Sundays. Perfect, but put it on your calendar July 17th to August 14th. And now let's pass the peace of Christ.
All right. Kiddos, if you are ready, if you're done passing the piece, and if you're not, we can wait. But there are folks who are ready and w willing, God bless them, to take you down to Faith Walk. So if you want to head down, Faith Walk is our version of Sunday school. And if you, it is best for your family, for your kiddos to stay right here in worship, know that we love having them here. So everyone wave. Have a great time at Faith Walk, everybody. You'll head out this door. There are some wonderful grown-ups here who are ready to take you downstairs and talk about how much Jesus loves you. So have a great time. And amen. See you later. Bye, Gideon. Good morning, church. Good morning. Welcome again to Centennial United Methodist Church. If you don't know me, I'm Pastor Whitney Sheridan, and I'm so glad to be with you all um, this morning and every Sunday morning that we get to worship together. We are going to jump right in. We are in our second week of a brand new sermon series that we are calling King David. Doesn't this look like a movie poster? I just love it. Aren't you pumped already to learn about King David? So raise your hand if you're familiar with David. Yes, we've heard of him before. Raise your hand if you know anything about him besides his fight with Goliath. Now we know more, right? We started, so we're going to be learning more about King David because here's what I think. I think King David is a really big figure in scripture, and yet our traditional like Sunday school stories really limit us to knowing a few, and a few might even be generous, a few stories about David. There's a lot more in here to learn. I think he's a controversial character in scripture. I think like Peter, he has these giant swings of ups and downs in his relationship with God. There's a lot for us to learn about David's relationship with God and with his faith. Um, and we're going to be taking a look specifically through the lens of his relationships with people. So we started, there is no way to talk about King David without talking about his relationship with King Saul, the actual first king of Israel. Um, but even, to, and that's what we talked about last week, but even to begin talking about his relationship with Saul, we kind of have to go back to like, how did Saul become king? So real fast, what we covered last week, we learned um, that Israel at the time of Saul, we're not going to scripture yet, can I go to the map? Because y'all need a map, right? To start your day. All right. We learned that before the Israel was uh, united into one kingdom, there were tribes of Israel, and they all had different um, territories, right? These were named after the 12 sons of Israel, who's later named Israel, first Jacob. And so these were kind of loosey-goosey borders, right? These were really groups of people, families that have continued and kind of grown, um, but they were like generally residing in these regions. And as you know, when like borders, right, aren't hard and fast, you've got lots of people who are like, oh, is this too far? Is this too far, right? We're all suddenly turning into three-year-olds who want to like see where the boundary really is, right? And so here's the thing. Um, all of these tribes of Israel often found themselves in conflict. And I am going to pause here and say that as we continue to learn about stories that take place in this space and this place that we are continuing to hear about on the news every single day, May we hold these stories that we read thoughtfully and prayerfully as we take what we learn in scripture and apply it to today. Amen? Can we, can we all agree to do that? Okay. This place is not new to conflict. So there existed a lot of conflict around this particular area, this valuable area, this chosen land, this promised land. So there were particularly a groups called the Philistines. Everyone say Philistines. Philistines that existed in the time of Saul, in the time of David, they really resided like right around here. Again, this particular spot seems to be on the news a lot and not, yeah, seeing a lot of conflict, but right around this kind of area of Judah, Benjamin, Dan, um, the Philistines were right here and they were fighting the Israelites a lot. Um, and because Israel and these tribes, they didn't have um, border, they didn't have real hard borders, they didn't have a king, they didn't have a great representation, they were ruled by these judges. There's a book in the Bible in the Old Testament called Judges, what are those? Um, these are like military leaders, these are prophets, these are priests, these are folks that have been given the authority of the people that have seen the authority, um, that especially kind of have the word and the voice of God in their ear, and they go from place to place to settle disputes, to lead and guide the people. So they really are almost like self, um, 
the people of Israel like kind of brought up and lifted up these particular people and that they respected, right? So these are the judges. And in this time, in the time of Saul, um, the judge that was kind of helping out and ruling over the tribes of Israel is named Samuel. We see books named Samuel. He was a prophet. He's the here I am, here I am God story, yes. So there was a lot of conflict here, and we get to know Saul because in this conflict, Israel started to like lose some of these fights, some of these um, conflicts and war and battles in different places. And so they were desperate for the might of God, the power of God to be on their side. So they asked for the Ark of the Covenant to be brought to the front lines, to the battlefield. They thought, surely, if God's presence in this Ark of the Covenant, this box that holds the staff and the, and the tablets of the, old, um, of the Ten Commandments, we think God's presence resides in these special things. We're going to bring them to the front lines, and they'll help us win. God will help us win. That is not how it went. The Philistines stole the Ark of the Covenant, tossed it around from place to place, from Philistine City to Philistine City. They didn't like having it because everyone who had it got cursed bad news for them. They sent it back to the Israelites, um, but the Israelites continued to experience these ups and downs in their battle with the Philistines. And so what happened was they said, you know, we need like a gap. Yes, God has like been fighting for us, sort of, but we keep also kind of losing these battles, and so we really want a king. We want a king who's going to rally us together. We want a king who's going to fight for us on the front lines. And Samuel said, you don't need a king. You have God. God's been on your side. And they're like, yeah, God is great, but we really want a king. Um, and enter Saul. God gives in and says, fine, you want a king? I'll give you a king. Here's a king. Here's Saul. Look at him go. Um, and Saul does pretty well at first. He is successful in all of these military battles, wins a bunch of fights, um, and helps the Israelites win um, to the point where he gets a bunch of people on his side. They're like, yes, this guy is great. We love Saul. We love King Saul. Um, but unfortunately, the future with Saul and Saul's leadership starts to kind of be on shaky ground with Samuel and with God. He continues to kind of mess up and not quite completely fulfill what Samuel, what God tell him so, tell him to do. Almost like he is unsure, gets a little nervous of God's promise and providence for them. And so he starts to cut a few corners. Um, and this makes Samuel, makes God feel like you are not pointing the people back to God, right? We're kind of living back into this I think, this is my interpretation now, kind of living back in this scarcity mindset, right? Everything should be pointing to our reliance and our love and our devotion to God. So both Samuel and God say, Saul's got to go. God sends Saul to go find this young boy named David. Go to this um, land where this guy named Jesse is. He's got a bunch of sons. One of his sons is the one, is the one. Samuel finds David, anoints him then and there, unbeknownst. To Saul. And then we found out that Saul serendipitously says, you know, I'm kind of on the outs with Samuel and God. It's stressing me out. Um, and the people who surround him say, you know what you need? You need music in your life. You need something that is just going to help you relax. We know a guy who's really good at music. His name is David. Would you like to meet him? And David becomes employed by Saul. And suddenly David is um, a part of this, what becomes this power struggle what becomes this competition that he did not choose. David finds himself um, seeing Goliath across um, the battlefield, says, I've got this. He takes down Goliath. He becomes this military he hero. And suddenly all eyes in Israel turn to David and said, oh, this guy. We thought Saul was all right, but this guy is really special. This does not make Saul feel any more secure. In his position as king, in his status with the people, with God, in relationship with one another. And so Saul flips. Saul suddenly comes this, like, fanatical guy who is perpetually trying to put an end to David. David is his competition, and a competition that David did not ask to be a part of. So, from where we left off in scripture last week, now we are seeing Saul continue to kind of hunt after David, trying to put an end to David, tries to kill David himself with a spear, tries to hire a hitman to kill David um, on his, like, wedding night um, to Saul's daughter, Michal, which is an interesting story. Y'all, if you want, if you're, like, really into soaps or, like, a really good spicy war drama, 
I, like, I will send you to 1 Samuel. It's a page turner. Please consider looking into it. So, but the thing is, David seems to be looked after, finds himself being looked after by the people around him. He's really won the hearts of folks, specifically not just with Saul's daughter, Michal, who um, David marries, is one of David's many wives, but also Saul's son, Jonathan. So we are going to jump into our scripture lesson today, and this is all about kind of the beginning, the blossoming of David and Jonathan's relationship. So let's read together from 1 Samuel chapter 18, verses 1 to 5. When David had finished speaking to Saul, the soul of Jonathan was bound to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Saul took him that day and would not let him return to his father's house. Then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that he was wearing and gave it to David and his armor and even his sword and his bow and his belt. David went out and was successful wherever Saul sent him. As a result, Saul sent him over an army and all the people, even the servants of Saul, approved. Now, family of faith, it is June. And what's June? Pride Month. So let's talk about David and Samuel, shall we? Raise your hand if you have been curious about the relationship between David and Samuel. A few? Raise your hand if you're not so curious, you know what you think about the relationship between David and Jonathan. Sorry, I said David and Samuel before. David and Jonathan. Raise your hand if honest to God and it's authentic and you're safe here. Raise your hand if Jonathan who? Yeah, that's super fair. Don't worry. Don't worry. There is this relationship, this, these two people in this story. And Jonathan is a really important part, a lofted up part of King David's story. And you hear this devotion that they have for one another. And this will last throughout um, their military careers. They both get married, but they are deeply devoted to one another. They protect one another. They look out for one another. They love each other as if they were, like, as their own souls. There is this word in Hebrew that is used here in this scripture that is um, to love. The root of it is Aheb. Everyone say Aheb. Aheb. And here's what I will say. We have paragraphs like this that describe this relationship between Jonathan and David. Nowhere does it explicitly say that this is a romantic relationship. Nowhere does it explicitly say it isn't. But we know they are deeply devoted to each other. This word used, or this word that is used is Aheb. It is the same word that is used to describe the relationship between Isaac and Rebecca, husband and wife, who choose one another, who deeply love each other. It's also used in a familial sense between Abraham and Isaac, father and son, Isaac and Esau, father and son, Rebecca and Jacob, mother and son, Rebecca to jo or Jacob to Joseph, father to son. And I looked into the Talmud, the Mishnah, which are these ancient Jewish oral traditions, right? These, like, the commentaries from the rabbis from way, way back that have been passed down to help people navigate through these stories. And what they say about this relationship between David and Jonathan is that this is a deep love, a pure love, unconcerned with other things that may cause love to end. But it is a pure and an endless love. They say it is an uns a characteristic of this kind of love is an unselfish love. The kind of love that makes the other person better, the one that's offering that kind of love, it makes you better. This Aheb is also used to describe God's love for us, our love to God. 
I think this is the kind of love that was pointed to in the Old Testament and a kind of love to be aspired toward, to aspire towards. So I will say, in my own opinion, if you were to ask me, is there any reason to refuse that this could have been a romantic relationship between Jonathan and David, I have no reason to say no. It is very possible. But deeper than just that fact is that this kind of love is lofted and is pointed to, is described with great care and devotion in our scripture. And we see these two choose one another over and over and over again throughout their lives together. They protect one another. And David is like perpetually on the run from Saul. And Jonathan is playing that middleman. He's saying, go hide, David. My father is going to try to kill you again tonight. Go hide it in a field. And Jonathan is always there trying to like talk Saul down from the ledge. They are perpetually like going out for one another, right? Fighting for one another. When they have to separate and part Scriptures describe a deep pain and grief when they must part ways, when they can't be near one another. Saul and Jonathan eventually die on the battlefield, and when David finds out about it and is officially king of Israel, it would have been perhaps even a smart thing for David to say, all right, the line of Saul needs to be done. But instead, David takes Jonathan's son, who again is in the line of Saul, Saul, Jonathan, Jonathan's son, and puts him at his royal table on his royal council in honor of Jonathan, in honor of this person that he has deep love for. Regardless of the exact nature of their relationship with one another, their love is undeniably pure undeniably good, undeniably holy. It is this kind of love where they experience support, promise, devotion, gratitude, unselfishness. And in a relationship where that is mutual between those people, I mean, that's magic. And it is through this relationship, through this kind of love, that God transforms Israel brings Israel to a new place, brings David to a new place. And so as we continue to learn about David, as you go home and ponder this relationship that maybe you're hearing about for the very first time, I think this is also a story that we can see the juxtaposition between those who believed that God's power was in God's might and God's ability to help us win wars, and God's ability to help us conquer all that we decide to conquer, versus those who find God's power in this pure and unselfish love. If we believe scripture that God is love, let us consider our own relationships, our own loving relationships, those kind of relationships that make us better those relationships that we experience someone's unconditional and unmovable and eternal and pure love for us, how that makes us feel, how that changes us, how that settles and sets us into words like promise, makes hope and the future suddenly brighter for us. And let us consider how God is perpetually at work, not through might, but through love. Amen? Amen. We're now entering our time of giving. We believe that giving is part of what it means to follow Jesus. Please give and give faithfully.
Is it on? There we go. Friends, today especially, it is good to be reminded of what we got to celebrate a couple weeks ago, and we will continue to celebrate the changes that were made at General Conference that really opened up this table to a table that is inclusive of all on both sides. The United Methodist Church has had an open table where all are welcome to come and to receive who seek to know and love God. And until just recently, it was like 52 years that on this side of the table, we had restrictions in place about who could serve and preside at the table. Those restrictions have been removed, and now all are welcome to come just as they are, authentically their whole selves, to love and serve God. So today when we come, we come to remember Christ, his love, his grace, as he gathered with his disciples, his closest friends. He gathered them together to remember. He took a bread, he gave thanks to God, broke the bread, gave it to each of his disciples saying, take this and eat. This is my blood, my body given for you, for all. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, Jesus took the cup and he gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples saying, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood, the new covenant poured out for you, for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us pray together. Spirit of God, fall afresh on us gathered here, on all those who are watching now and who will watch later on. May your spirit make these simple gifts of bread and the vine be for us, your body, your blood, your life, and your love that nourishes and sustains us so that we get to be your hands and your feet in the world. May we live each and every day in such a way that others would recognize you and your love within us. Gracious God, be with those who are hurt. Be with those who are healing. Comfort all those who grieve. Lift up the brokenhearted, those who have been pushed aside and forgotten. Make each of our paths before us clear. We have a lot of work to do before your kingdom truly comes on earth as it is is in heaven. And yet we have so much to celebrate. We celebrate the many places and people and relationships where we have seen your love lived out. Your love that knows no boundaries. We give thanks for the countless ways that you continue to pour out your love and your grace. And we indeed give you thanks. May your spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other and one in ministry this day and always to the whole world. We pray all of this in the name of our risen Christ who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We invite our communion servers to come forward. As you're dismissed by the ushers to come and receive, you'll um, hold out your hand to receive a piece of the bread that you can then uh, dip into the cup to receive both elements together. Gluten-free sealed elements are also available if you need those as well. Friends, we invite you to come and receive the grace. Treasure 
song. I was thinking about the story of uh, King David and, and Saul this week. And I'm not sure if you've seen that uh, meme that's often pops up on social media about how God uses flawed people. I just think about the story in particular about people being used by God who are inherently flawed. And Eli was uh, pointing out uh, so graciously that uh, 
we actually all fall under that category, no matter how much we don't think that's true. But good things can come out of flawed people. Redemption is real. Hope is real. Love is real. These things exist because you can be a conduit of God to people who need each and every one of these gifts. So this week I thought I'd send us out uh, not uh, on a mountain, but hopefully pondering how we as broken people, part of this story of redemption, can be part of someone else's story of redemption and healing. So would you please stand and sing with us?
go from this place of worship into your lives where we are called to worship God. May you love one another as God has loved you. May we be changed and transformed and may this world be changed and transformed through God's love, through the peace and grace in Jesus Christ and the power, the claim that the Spirit has on all of us. Go from this place to love and serve the Lord, you beautiful, beautiful people of God. And all God's people said, Amen. <laughs>